everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to our third Spies and Spy Masters Happy Hour brought to you by the International Spy Museum. My name is Hannah Saloyo. I am with the museum. And tonight we are centered around the Soviet Romeo spy, Dmitry Bistri-Liotov. Um, it's gonna be led by one of my favorite coworkers, uh, Shauna Oltman. Hey, Shauna. Um, she's the exhibition and programs manager of the museum. And then later in the program, who he came in early, here he is, is uh, Costa Ronin. You guys might know him from TV, TV shows such as The Americans or Homeland. Uh, but to all of us at the museum, he actually is our own bistro in our Spies and Spies Masters exhibit. Um, but before we do that, we are going to head over to Stoney's on P Street. Hi, Howie. Nice to see you. And Howie is going to whip up us a cocktail to get going. And Howie, I hear you're going to make us a Moscow mule. Yes. Uh, today we're making a Moscow mule. This is actually very easy to make at home. The biggest thing that they say about it is the glassware. If you've got a copper mug, that's how it should properly be, uh, be served in. If not, just a, a regular Collins glass will work. Super easy. You get the glass, you fill it with ice, you get your Stolichnaya uh, vodka. Also <laughs> <laughs> approved. Yeah. about a four count, Approval. a little bit heavier <laughs> than a shot. So you would count one, two, three, make it four. Um, you want some fresh limes. So a couple in there, two is enough. <laughs> and then we brought uh, the Gosling's ginger beer. Top it off with some ginger beer. Sorry. And then mix it up. It's super easy. It's super refreshing. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Ooh. Cheers. Cheers, uh, guys. I'm the show. Thanks, Howie, and thank you Cheers. so much. Um, just so everyone knows, uh, Stoney's on P Street, if you happen to be in the DC Logan Circle area, they are open for pickup orders. So if you do not want to cook tonight, um, feel free to call in and pick up order there and Howie will get you covered. So now over to our program. Um, Costa, I'm going to dip you out for now and we'll see you in a little bit. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Um, so Shauna Oltmans is the Exhibition and Programs Manager of the International Spy Museum. She actually worked on various exhibits for the museum, including Propaganda, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and what we're all here for today, the Spies and Spy Master exhibit on Beast, uh, Dmitry Bistri Lyotov, that is a mouthful, um, and part of Shauna's work on the exhibit was co-writing a script for video. Um, and she actually got to fly out to LA, which is how she met our wonderful actor, Costa, and He'll, when after she's done, he'll jump back on. We'll have some question time. So Shauna, I'm gonna turn the screen over to you. All right. First of all, thank you for joining us tonight. I'm so excited to share the story of Dmitry Vishulyotov, a man whose life is really even more unbelievable and sometimes unrealistic than a James Bond movie. Vishulyotov uh, was born on January 3rd, 1901 and spent most of his childhood fostered by an aristocratic family in St. Petersburg. He never met his father and he saw his mother very rarely. She would typically visit just a couple times a year. So he had a very, very lonely childhood growing up. But he did have this aristocratic upbringing, which meant that he was taught all of the manners of the upper class, um, as well as fencing, dancing, and drawing. And drawing was one of the things he really took to. He really loved it. It's something he continues to do throughout his life. Uh, and oftentimes, he would like to actually be an artist. Uh, but life takes him in a different direction. He's also taught the European languages. So English, French, and German. And he is fluent in all of those. He actually has quite a knack for languages. and Throughout his life, he ends up becoming fluent in over a dozen languages, which becomes incredibly useful during his career as an intelligence officer. Now, during his teenage years, he goes to nautical school, becomes a sailor, he spends some time doing that. But when the with the outbreak of the Civil War in Russia, he actually then ends up fleeing to avoid being conscripted to, to fight. And he eventually ends up making his way to Prague. And Prague 
is where his intelligence career begins. In 1925, Bichelyotov was recruited by the OGPU, which is kind of an early precursor to the KGB. And with Bichelyotov's skill with languages and his aristocratic upbringing, they thought, you know, he could be perfect to infiltrate those upper classes of Europe. And so he begins working for the Soviet trade mission in an official capacity uh, as a translator. Uh, so he's there legally, but the work he's doing is really anything but legal. Now, I may have forgotten to mention one other thing that made him very appealing uh, to these recruiters. Bishulyotov is very good looking. Uh, this is one of the main things that also uh, really helps him. So Hannah, I know you want to cheers to that. Uh, uh, yes, I do. <laughs> cheers, the most handsome cheers. spy in the museum. I know, who doesn't want a handsome spy? So this is one of the things that definitely, definitely uh, helps him with his collecting of intelligence. Um, he uses his charm and good looks to seduce secretaries and typists in Prague who have access to machinery blueprints and production data that the Soviet Union really wants uh, at this time. And I have a picture of how he's doing this. So I'm gonna try and share with you all uh, a little video of what is playing in my mind when I see All right, so you might be thinking, why on earth did you just show that? That has nothing to do with anything. Uh, so actually, that little video montage is clips from the film that Bistro Leotov actually wrote the screenplay for later on in life, depicting his, uh, um, depicting some of his missions as an intelligence officer. So that actor that you saw is portraying him. That is supposed to be him, and he looks pretty good for being Bistro Leotov. So that's what I imagine is he's charming all of these women in Prague. But not everyone falls for his charms quite so easily. One of the more uh, challenging targets that he was given was to recruit this French embassy typist, Marie Elaine, who is referred to by the code name La Roche. She had access to French diplomatic codes and ciphers, and the Soviets wanted access to them. But Marie, Marie Elaine was not like Bichelyotov's previous conquests. She did not easily come to his uh, charms. No, she expected marriage. And so after months of building a relationship with Marie Lane, she finally started to respond to his advances. But just when he thought he was about to seal the deal, he fell in love and married another woman, Maria Milena Yolanta Shamatova. Bishuliotov ends up referring to her as Yolanta uh, throughout his memoirs, so that's how I'll refer to her. But basically, he saw her handing out communist pamphlets and immediately fell for her. They got married the very next day. Talk about a quick romance. Uh, that, that's pretty fast. But on his wedding night, he doesn't spend it with Yolanta, his new bride. He ends up spending his wedding night back with Marie Elaine. So not the best start to a marriage. But he now starts getting the information about those French codes from a Marie Elaine that the Soviets wanted so badly. So this goes on for a few years. Uh, eventually, they want Bichelyotov to break it off with Marie Elaine. Uh, they have a brand new mission for him and uh, he has to break it off with her and she is completely devastated. And Bichelyotov is also quite disgusted by this. He really has come to care for her. You know, this, this whole uh, scenario has really broken up him, his wife. It's been quite hard on him. But at this moment, he is still fiercely loyal to the communist cause. Uh, but he doesn't, leaves kind of a bad taste in his mouth how this whole operation ends. Now, to talk about his marriage with Yolanta, thinking about this type of start, 
um, if it's any indication, their marriage is not going to be particularly easy or happy. Uh, they had a really tumultuous relationship. She also works uh, for Soviet intelligence. So throughout their marriage, both of them are constantly traveling around Europe. They are separated from each other often. Uh, she gets imprisoned. So it's, it's really quite hard on them as well. But as I mentioned, uh, Bishlyotov's time in Prague is about to come to an end. They have a new role for him to fill. And so in 1930, Soviet intelligence gave Bishlyotov a new role, capitalizing on his skill with languages and that aristocratic upbringing. They sent him on missions all over Europe, but now he'd be operating on his own as what the Russians would call an illegal or operating without official cover. This meant that if Bishlyotov were caught, he's completely on his own. The Soviet Union would not claim him. So the only thing that is between him and imprisonment or potentially death are his own wits. And so that's what, that's what he has to rely on. And he excelled in this new role. He was a master of deception and took on numerous covers and personas. Some of those are on the slide now. Um, he was really quite an expert at uh, changing his appearance. Um, and he was everything from a sailor to a gangster, to a businessman, to a fisherman. He was a British Lord at one point, a Dutch artist, a Hungarian count. He took on all of these different roles and personas and was quite skilled at that. And by using these uh, different identities, he was able to cross European borders countless times, gathering codes, uh, smuggling documents and weapons, and he was incredibly, incredibly successful with that. Now, there is more to this cover than just, you know, changing your appearance. He also had to have the right documentation. So, he ended up getting passports. These were all legitimate passports. None of these were, were forged um, in terms of being fake documents. They were false in the sense that that wasn't his identity, but they were uh, genuine. And so he got the uh, these documents in order, but he also had to make sure that every aspect of his life reflected that cover. As Bishlyotov once said, if you pose as a herring salesman, you should be able to tell one herring from another. You should learn how a herring salesman moves and talks. You should reek of herring. So that's kind of the motto that he goes, goes for. And as the Greek merchant Alexander Gallas, I'll give you a little background on how he really brings together this cover. He's in Berlin while he's developing this cover. And so he goes to all these Greek shops. He befriends the owners and he kind of uses for the reason why he doesn't speak Greek so well is his family left Greece when he was a baby. He didn't grow up speaking the language. Um, he actually hasn't been there, but he has a deep love of his home. He also then joins the local Greek Orthodox Church. He befriended the tourists and the students there and asked them that when they would return to Greece, they would send him postcards and letters. So he would litter his home with these uh, postcards and letters. That way, if anyone happened to visit his home, they would find someone who seemed to be pretty Greek. Uh, so it was those extra steps that he would take to make sure that his cover was truly, truly uh, believable. Now I'm gonna share a short story about, he went on missions all over Europe, including uh, he even went to Africa, South America as well. So I'm going to just share one of his missions um, that he, he undertook, and that was in Berlin. And so Germany was a country the Soviet Union was very interested in in the 1930s. Hitler and the Nazis had just come into power. What were their intentions? So in 1935, he was sent to Berlin to discover what Germany's rearmament plans were. And that information was guarded by Doris Mueller, an SS officer who was fanatically loyal to the Nazi party. And she was chosen to guard this information, in part because of that, 
strong devotion to her party, but also because they considered her to be quite unattractive. And so they thought was if any man paid attention to her, clearly something was up. They weren't genuinely into her. And so that would tip them off. So what's Beecher Leotop going to do? He can't use his normal seductive charm. He has to find a different way in. So he becomes the Hungarian Count Pirelli de Caroli Haza. And he approached Doris as this foreigner, ignorant of these Nazi politics, but very eager to learn. So she passionately rants about the genius of the Nazi party. And she slowly starts to turn that passion from the Nazis, she turns that passion towards Bisholiotov. And soon she's falling in love with him. And so he promises to marry her. Is this sounding a little bit familiar, like Marie Elaine? Yeah, he promises to marry a number of women, but doesn't always marry them. But he tells her he, they can't get married because he doesn't have enough money. So he proposed the idea that they could play the stock market. If they knew what military equipment the Nazis were going to buy, they could buy up all those stocks beforehand and then sell them for a profit. And that's how he's going to make the money. Doris eventually agrees. He starts getting this information, passes it along. And eventually, uh, he's needed other places. And so he needs to break it off with Doris, but he can't just all of a sudden disappear. That would tip too many people off. So they come up with a plan that he can get away from Doris. He tells Doris, I have to go back to Hungary, you know, sort through some financial issues, get everything settled. And when I come back, then we can get married. So he goes to Hungary. Meanwhile, while he's gone, Doris finds out that in this newspaper clipping, a Hungarian newspaper clipping, there is a article about a Hungarian count who has tragically died in a hunting accident. And that is our Bistro Leotov. She is devastated and heartbroken and Bistro Leotov is on to his next mission. Now, by 1937, Bishop Leotop had grown weary of this double life. It was mentally and emotionally exhausting to constantly lead this life. Um, and he just knows he's one misstep away from imprisonment or death. So eventually he finally gets called back to his homeland, 1937. And he doesn't get this quiet type of retirement or quiet life where he can write and draw and be an artist. No, instead, he gets swept up in Soviet leader Joseph Stalin's political purges. This is a time period between 1936 and 1938, uh, when it was the period of political repression where uh, perceived political rivals were killed or sent to forced labor camps. Intelligence officers were included in this roundup and nearly all of Bishliotov's colleagues ended up being executed or imprisoned. So Bistro Leotov is arrested on September 1938. He was beaten and tortured for months until he confessed to anti-Soviet activities and was sentenced to 20 years in prison and five years deprivation of civil rights. He was sent to the Gulag, which was a network of forced labor camps in the Soviet Union. These were brutal places with limited food, poor shelter, grueling physical labor, disease, and freezing winters. Exact numbers aren't known, but millions of people passed through the Gulag and estimates of over 1 million people died within them. So this is what Bishuliotov is in. And we actually have a number of artifacts from his time in the Gulag. These are his mittens and a spoon that you can see he decorated. Uh, we have these on display in the museum right now. And Bishul Yotov survived this imprisonment by, by relying on those same skills that helped him as an intelligence officer, his resourcefulness, charm, quick thinking. He would barter with other prisoners by taking advantage of his artistic talents and offering to create sketches of themselves or their loved ones in return for a potato, an onion, a cigarette. But what he most coveted was ink and paper because he begins writing a camp manuscript where he starts talking about some of his missions in Africa. But ink was hard to come by. So he used iodine, which he traded with women who were working 
in the infirmary for lipstick um, that he would create. Because even in the gulag, you want to look your best. You need to have that great lip color. And he wrote the African uh, missions manuscript that you see now. And for the cover, he used his long underwear and cut pieces out of that to create it. So that's what you see the image on the left there. Uh, that is some of Bishul Yotav's long underwear, which this is also on display in the museum. While he was imprisoned, he learned that his wife, Yolanta, had actually died. Uh, she was rounded up with other wives of traders and put on a train to a camp. She was incredibly ill at the time, um, and she didn't want to be a burden to those around her, so she ends up ending her life. Bishul Yotav was devastated by the death of Yolanta, but he managed to find love again. Despite being imprisoned and in these destitute conditions, Bishul Yotav had a number of relationships with other prisoners. One woman who was especially meaningful to him was Anna Inova, and they fell in love and eventually ended up getting married. But it's while Bishriotov was in prison that he began thinking about his career as an intelligence officer and started to question his blind loyalty to this grand socialist cause. He saw what happened in these camps where he, an innocent man who had spent his life working for the good of his country, was imprisoned alongside common criminals, traitors, uh, even, even Nazis, um, and fellow innocent people. He became disillusioned with this idea of the Soviet cause. Before, he had been willing to sacrifice his life for his country and for this cause. But after being imprisoned, he slowly began to see the faults in the society he had so deeply believed in. So this was when this idea to record what he was seeing in these camps and his experience as an intelligence officer first entered his head and became the sole focus for when he was released from the gulag. And in 1954, oops, I forgot, these are a couple uh, manuscripts and also a self-portrait he does uh, while he is imprisoned. And then in 1954, after 16 years imprisonment, Bishul Yotov was released uh, due to poor health. During his imprisonment, he had suffered multiple beatings, broken ribs, nerve damage, and paralysis. He was a broken man when he was released, but his love from the camp, Anna, she is there to help him recover. She had been released a few years prior. And once he regained his strength, recording his memoirs and telling the world what happened in the camps became his primary mission. After four years, he finished his memoirs and he ended up writing the screenplay with that highly sanitized version of his intelligence career which became that film, The Plain Clothesman, which was released in 1973, ensuring that part of his story did end up making it to the public. On May 3rd, 1975, at the age of 74, Dmitry Alexandrovich Bishuliotov died. But with his memoirs completed, his story was able to live on. Now we highlight Bishul Yotov in the museum because he represents many of the critical traits a successful intelligence officer needs to exceed, especially deception. So I now I'm gonna share with you all a short clip from our exhibition with our talented actor, Kasa Ronan, portraying Bishul Yotov. Ciao. Guten Tag. <clears throat> Hello? Ah, English. Forgive me for not noticing. Welcome. Please, welcome to my home. You probably wondering who I am. Bastralyotov. Dmitry Alexandrovich Bastralyotov. At your service. You know, I was not always the way you see me right now festering in a Siberian rat hole for over 15 years. Uh, once I was charming, debonair, dashing. I looked like a movie star. I mean, people said like that American actor, Clark Gable. Fashionable, too. I was a star. 
of Stalin's socialist regime. All right. So it is my pleasure to introduce Kostya Ronin, our favorite Russian spy who portrays Oleg and the Americans, Yevgeny on Homeland. I believe the series finale is Sunday, right? It's Sunday. Yeah. 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 Very, very exciting. Kosta, thank you so, so much for being here and joining us today. Of course, of course, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for organizing this. And yeah. I cannot wait to, to come out, come over to Washington and, and actually see it in person. We cannot wait to have you. You've got, everyone knows you in the museum as Bistro. Um, so we can't <laughs> wait to have you. Um, I just got a few questions for you. First, had you ever heard of Bistro Leotov before we started this project? No, no, I haven't. Um, there were a lot of spies when I was doing the research for the Americans. There was there were a lot of spies uh, who were very uh, uh, bright and who did a lot for the Soviet Union. And uh, I mean, the idea of if you're a good spy, nobody knows your name. Exactly. That's kind of how it works. <laughs> and with the Stralyot of uh, all the information was declassified only, uh, I think, in the sort of 80s when when, when Gorbachev came to power. Uh, so no, there wasn't a lot available back then. Now, of course, there's a lot more. And now, because of the museum, there's going to be even more. <laughs> there is, exactly. And um, so now that you've, you know, you've learned more about him, what about Bishleotov's life did you find most fascinating? You know, when you start researching somebody who actually existed in real life, what's fascinating is you know how the person's life ends. And then you go back and you look at the photographs of that person at a young age with his parents, his friends, and, and you look him straight in the eye. He has no idea what's ahead of him, but you do. And that is always a very, very... Uh, emotional moment for me because you feel a little bit uh ahead of time you feel like you know more than the actual person you're about to play you know his life you know what's going to happen and why it's going to happen um what i found the most fascinating about his life was the fact that it normally spies kind of take up a craft to get to somebody he took it upon himself to actually widen up his world and actually learn all those things and learn about the craft and about drawing and painting and writing and over 20 languages not because he wanted to use it in spy craft but because he was actually genuinely interested in life he was a very very curious person and uh that of course helped him uh in his career uh but he was still a very, very curious person, a genius person, because he was able to do it perfectly. He was able to speak all those languages perfectly. He was able to pass as a painter and not just kind of pretend to be a painter. And what we know from actual spy craft, the way it's done today and the way it's been done in sort of in the later half of the 20th century is that most of the time when there is a meet, uh, the spy and the asset would not come close to one another because the, the wig and the makeup and all that sort of stuff is being done last minute and it looks fake. Uh, it does look fake. Um, and so for him to be able to really get into the shoes of the people he was becoming is really quite incredible. It's really sort of acting at its best. Absolutely. That's kind of what I was thinking about when I was uh, thinking about you portraying him. I was like, actually, I was like, you're going to actually fit into his shoes uh, quite quite well um, since you're already used to taking on these different uh, personas. He wasn't he wasn't acting those 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 characters. He was actually becoming those characters. Mm -hmm. And um, um yeah and it's quite quite interesting when, when he actually wrote uh those notes and those books and brought them to the archive. Nobody even took took him seriously. Um and then later that work became very, very secretive and wasn't sort of uncovered until mid eighties. So it's uh, there's a lot to it. The, oh my, there's more. There's so much more to his story, which you know, um, and I just didn't have time to tell all of it. Um, I do want to touch on when we were on set filming, you had mentioned that you actually did have a personal connection to this 
very dark history with your grandfather actually being swept up in the gulag. Do you mind talking about that a little bit and how that affected your take on the role? Uh, it wasn't my grandfather. It was my great-grandfather. It was okay. my grandmother's father. Uh, it was that time in the history of the Soviet Union where, you know, there was a lot of restructuring and they were trying to figure out how to build a new country. And one of the moves they they kind of performed was rounding up all the, the brightest and the best and, and the most sort of powerful, I guess, in their own fields uh, and sending them away from Moscow. And my great grandfather was one of those people. And my grandmother was very young uh, when he got taken away. And um, when he came back, she was already married. And uh, he lived for another, I think, six months or so. And he passed away from all the health complications in the uh, camps. Because Gulag, a lot of people sort of term Gulag as this sort of concept. Gulag was one camp, but there were all these other camps, the work camps that were sort of. Uh, along the north, uh, north, west, and also the northern part of Russia and then Siberia, um, you know, a lot of them were sort of voluntary, which means that they were not protected. But the reason they were not protected is that uh, where you gonna go? There's nowhere to go. Yeah. You have days and days and days in Siberia in the snow in minus uh, 50 degrees weather to get somewhere, and it's impossible. So. Yeah, you're you're not trying to get there's just yeah, not trying to get out of there. Um as an actor who well you kind of mentioned this, but um since you're always taking on uh different roles, did that make you feel a special certain connection to Bisho Leokak, who also is kind of taking on different roles constantly? To a degree, yes. I mean i I guess it's something that we have very um uh, something we have in common i guess because we basically um follow the same path and becoming those those characters you know my idea is not to really kind of go out and, and act a part my idea is to think the thoughts of the character i play and sort of sync up the heartbeats mine and, and the character i play and then become him and that's what he did in a way uh hence all, all the things he went out and studied and and, and did in his life so absolutely, we, we definitely. I'm sure. I'm sure we we use the same uh, same technique to get under the skin <laughs> of the character. Um, uh, I don't know if if sort of our love lives are sort of <laughs> similar. Uh, I don't know. I don't think any of uh, the moves he uh, he put on would work today. I really doubt that. No, you're not um, proposing marriage left and right to all the ladies. Constantly? No, no, no. I, I don't think it would work in the spy world either. Um, <laughs> tragically, when he was rounded up, uh, his wife committed suicide and, and they had a young baby as well. And uh, it's, you know, when you think about it, it's very, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's half the problem to be able to, you know, to, to go away from everything you love, but completely something else to know that once you were gone, your wife took your own life as well. And it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I don't think he ever recovered from that. And I don't think anybody will recover from that in today's environment either. No, no, he lived through quite a few tragedies, um, which sometimes makes it almost all the more remarkable that he was able to move on and find love again, uh, despite that. Um, so you've played numerous spies, you kind of mentioned on the Americans and Homeland. Uh, did you receive any training or have any consultants from the intelligence world to assist with those roles? Um, yeah, absolutely. It's kind of part of the research. The, the most invaluable, the most valuable research you can, you can do is actually a face to, to face with somebody who went through those experiences. And uh, uh, sort of when I was preparing for the Americans, I had to research the first half of the 20th century. And then for Evgeny, I had to research the second half of the 20th century and the 21st century, because they, you know, what what Evgeny knows, Oleg would have no idea about. And mm -hmm. so during the process, I um, I did get a chance to meet and, and learn and work with uh, a number of uh, FBI and CIA agents on one side and KGB, FSB, GRU on the other side. And then also those who crossed from one, one side to another. Um, which is quite remarkable, you know. Uh, 
because yeah it's it's really quite remarkable to see what what and why they did that um in terms of spycraft it, it feels like the best spies were really in the beginning of the 20th century because then people were kind of becoming spies for the idea it wasn't for the money it wasn't for the medals or promotions uh, or uh, security risks in any way it was really for the idea because they wanted either the capitalism or, or the communism to win and that's when Bestralyotov mm -hmm. uh, became a spy as well uh, but also seeing that progression during the 20th century all these men have a lot in common a lot in common and on both sides of the uh, the, the ocean both in Russia or the Soviet Union before that and in, in the United States, they all have uh, the same loves and fears and ambitions. And what's amazing is that the most amazing thing that I found from talking to those people is that is the amount of truth they can actually offer, not just to somebody like myself, but also to their friends and their families and their coworkers. It's it's like you, when you wear a mask every day every day of your life. At some point, you kind of forget who you really are, uh, and that's what was continually happening to many of them. And and chances are that's what happened to our, our hero here. You know, there's a reason why when he came back, there was a you know there was a very strong conversation when he was demoted and sent into the records and to the archives, and literally six months later, he got arrested. Mm -hmm. uh, Maybe something did get to his head. We will never know. We won't know. We won't know. Yeah. And he, he talks about yeah how emotionally difficult it starts becoming because just as you said, you're living a different life for so long. It becomes very hard to to do that. Um, and my last question. Lose track, you lose track of what real is because what's real to you, you live in so many realities at the same time. You're a count and a merchant and a and a gangster but then you actually are not but you are because other you know you exist in that world and other people kind of take you for one of their own so which is the reality mm -hmm. it's really, that is the most fascinating thing about spycraft is, is what is the actual reality what is real it's back to the matrix <laughs> it is. oh my gosh that's exactly what it feels like <laughs> All right, and so I've got one last fun question for you before we open it up to, I know we've got lots of uh, audience questions coming in. So we know Bishliotov was this expert at deception, took on all these covers and personas. Uh, the Hungarian Count, Greek Merchant, he's an artist, gangster, all these things. If you got to pick any cover, what do you think you would want to pick to try to portray and live this double life? That's a great question. Um, you know, I think because through what I do uh, professionally, I already got a chance to be a gangster and I got a chance to be uh, a spy and a count. I think I would have to pick between a, a Greek merchant and a Hungarian count. Mm -hmm. I think being a merchant would be really interesting because I love sailing and that's something would sort of tap into my passion as well and uh, sort of mixing pleasure and work would be a lot of a lot of fun as well not to mention you get to sail and see the world as well Absolutely. and it's the Mediterranean so you get to sail in the med and also yeah. <laughs> why not that's true that's true the location is important as well as where you're getting to live um, that's, that's absolutely. have to smell like fish like he was saying you yeah. know like love the fish into yourself yeah i think i'll skip yeah the the fish the herring salesman i think i'll skip that one um yeah that one doesn't sound as good to me either um wonderful well casa thank you so much i think hannah we are ready to uh get some questions from the audience if you're ready for us i am we have got tons of questions coming in both for bistro and on the homeland side so i'm going to try to do my best <laughs> to, to even it out here um and not give away any spoilers hopefully um, so you kind of just touched on this, Shauna, um, asked, uh, Costa, but Shauna, what is your favorite bistro cover? Cause I know when you think spy, I think Shauna, I think bistro, I know you are like our resident bistro lover. So do you have a favorite that you wish had seduced you? Oh my gosh. Wow. Wow. I don't know about that. I think my husband's watching, so I don't know if I can say that, but, um, oh, I, you know, I really love this, the Dutch artist. 
Um, that's one of the covers he uses uh, for this uh, difficult mission where he's trying to find this man. And just the, and it, you know, art was his passion. So I think I would go with the Dutch artist would be my yeah. choice. Um, and speaking of seduction, everyone wants to know what is the name, and I know it's only in Russian, I believe, of the film you showed the clips from. So that is in English. It comes to okay. the plain clothes, the plain clothesman. Okay, Russian, I know that in Russian it's called Chilevik Shtatskom. Yep, I was I was hoping you would do that, Costa, because uh, <laughs> I was going to butcher that. Um, and it is on YouTube, so you can watch the whole thing. And you can even do like if you need it to be in English, there's um you can do closed captions and it'll show up in English. It's not a very good translation. I had many Russian speaking friends help me out when I was watching that. Um, and speaking of covers and roles, it's kind of is uh, this is for you, Costa. People want to know what I've had a bunch of people ask this out of all the roles you've played. What is your favorite? A good guy like Oleg, a bad guy, possibly. Um, like in Homeland, or is it something like Agent Carter, or I don't know, Bistro from the Spy Museum? Your call. <laughs> I don't. I, I I really have a. Uh, I don't really think that either one of them was good or bad. I think uh, they kind of up sort of positioned as negative uh, or anti heroes because they always go head to head with the heroes of the story who are driving the story. But I don't look at them as uh, as negative. Uh, people or negative uh, characters because just like in every one of us there is the positive side and the negative side and uh, it was interesting to see during this season of homeland whenever uh, Evgeny and Kerry were sort of playing tag team and were on one side everybody's like yeah Evgeny great and then all of a sudden it's like die <laughs> So it's one of those things where I don't think it, it's call, naming uh, the, you know the favorite character is like saying who is your favorite child. Uh, it really is about giving birth to another human being. That's kind of the way I look at it. And uh, the hardest time in playing some somebody is is always the the final cut, which uh, we all will see this Sunday. Yeah, and that's when you have to put the the character on the coat hanger because this is it. Um, and speaking of the roles, and I think this is good because you said there's not a negative or a good or a bad, but in all the roles, someone, I had a couple of people ask, um, you always seem to inject really uh, humanity into all your roles and make people seem rather likable, even if you shouldn't like them or for certain things. How do you keep these characters, especially your spy characters, grounded? I make them real. Um, you, I mean, from a very young age, when I was studying um, the craft and I was going through the theater programs, what was important to me is not to play the character, but really, like I was mentioning earlier, becoming that the, that character or those characters and really kind of, because my job as an actor is create a wholesome human being and then bring him to set and let him play in the world that's created by the writers and the directors. And so if I if I act that character, everybody, will see fake straight away. Uh, so the, 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 the common DNA of the character's heritage kicks in at that point, you know? And so um, uh, I don't really have to like the character when I take that job. I know that, I know that my job is to make him real. Whether or not you can, as audience members, or me as an audience member, can relate to that character, that's something else. If if I like that character in relation to the hero of the story, that's something else. But my job is to make sure that the character is real. And that's what makes him grounded. That's what makes people relate to those characters, because people see the vulnerability of those characters. People see the hearts of those characters. And people understand why that character does what he does, whether or not they agree with what he does. And this is kind of has been uh, my process, my whole professional career <laughs> up, to, uh, up to this point. So I hope they, I hope it works. Uh, I hope uh, people are able to, the audience members are able to relate to the characters I play and whether or not they love him or they hate him, uh, at least they have an opinion about him. Very nice. Um, so I'm going to switch roles a little bit. Shauna, people are asking a bunch of questions about our Bistro exhibit, including where uh, you showed some of the images of our collection or what's on view at the museum, including my personal favorite is his um, 
self-portrait that he sketched while in the gulag and the mittens. Where did we get those wonderful items from? Oh, I'm so glad someone asked. So we got those uh, items from his step-grandson actually uh, donated those to the museum, uh, Sergei Milashov. And so he is the one who had those. He, when Bistroliotov is released, he is the son of uh, Anna, who is Bistroliotov's second wife. And so he actually gets to spend quite a bit of time with Bistroliotov before uh, Bistroliotov passes away in 1975. So he donated those items to us. And all of those images that you saw of Bishliotov, that is also from him. Uh, Bishliotov really kept quite an archive. Having those images are, are quite remarkable, especially when you consider the fact that he did get um, swept up into the gulag and you would think maybe they would have destroyed a lot of, a lot of those things, but those were preserved. So all of that uh, came from him. So that was very exciting for us. Um, and then do you have a favorite piece of the exhibit? Oh my gosh. I mean, the artifacts are, my, the, the camp manuscript I absolutely love, uh, just because thinking about, you know, using your underwear where you don't have very much and valuing so much that you tell the story that you're going to use your limited resources for that. But I mean, I have to say, I love my bistro video. Like, it's so it was yeah. so good when I was in LA and uh, Costa started started doing it. He got into the role so well, and you know this is a person I'd been reading about for so long, and to see him really come to life like Costa did was such a treat. And you were so interested in him as a person. I was floored that you would take as much interest in you as you did being this big time Hollywood actor, you know. Um, so I thought you did a fantastic job. And so I'm a little biased. And so that's one of my favorite <laughs> parts as well. Oh, please keep yeah. talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you should be show the clip over and over. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, Costa, people want to know what you think happened to Oleg after the Americans ended. Ooh, don't we all? I know. Um, <clears throat> I have a feeling he, because, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who are trying to link the Americans and Homeland and, and Oleg to uh, Yevgeny. Uh, there is no relationship between Oleg and <laughs> Yevgeny. Uh, sorry to break it. Through. Now I can. We've got one episode to go. <laughs> But uh, I have a feeling that he was exchanged during the prisoner exchange program uh, when Gorbachev came to power, uh, when the what's called the, the sort of warming stage in the relationship between the two countries before the Berlin Wall uh, fell down, which was one of the acts of, of that work together between the Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, so I feel the prisoner exchange would have been the first thing they wanted to do because he, you know, he didn't present any any value or any danger to the United States, and he didn't present any danger uh, or any value to the Soviet Union at that point. Um, one thing, I, I, like when we were shooting it, I really was gunning for the suicide. I wanted him to commit suicide, and they would not be just the dictators <laughs> would not give it to me. And I kept asking them and begging them and pleading with them, and they wouldn't give it to me. <laughs> so now I have to answer that that question. What happened to Oleg? <laughs> it would be so much clearer. <laughs> but no, yeah, he, he he came out, and uh, I have a feeling that he would have the, 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 his time outside of the prison would have been a lot harder than before he went in. I have a feeling that there would it would have been very difficult for him to uh, connect with his son, and that is the the one thing that uh, that's gonna haunt him for the rest of his life before. For those who watched the show, uh, when he left and he said that goodbye to his wife and, and his son, he knew he wasn't com coming back. And he knew what, what that's going to mean. Uh, and that was the hardest decision he ever had to make. Um, speaking of roles and how you research roles, I'm going to kind of combo a bunch of questions here because we're running out of time. So I'm going to try to throw in 14 different things in this. <laughs> um, so researching roles. You probably do a bunch of background information. I know you did talk to Shauna earlier about, you know, they bring in spec spies. I know members of our board have gone on um, and been assistants on films. Um, but part of this is Shauna research on books. So do you have a good book on Bistro? And then there's a second part. So why don't you do that first? Okay. 
So yes, um, I highly recommend it's Emil Dreitzer's Stalin's Romeo Spy. If we can put that in the chat, that'd be awesome. Uh, highly recommend that. And uh, Dreitzer actually met Bistro Lyotov uh, at the end of his life in 1973. He ended up getting to meet him and he had no idea who he was. It was a little bit of a chance meeting. So he actually got to interview him. And then many years later, uh, after these archives open up, he ends up researching and writing this book. So that is the book I would recommend. That's the book that I used um, as my uh, main source. So that's Emil Dreitzer, Stalin's Romeo Spy. And I asked that because this is for you, Costa. If they were to make a movie on Bistro, would that be a role you'd ever be interested in since you've already got one credit <laughs> of it under your belt? 100%. I, it, he's actually, uh, you know, after we, we, we did this, um, I actually went and I continued researching about him because I was just so fascinated by his life and what he was and, and the, the impact um, that was his work to uh, intelligence and counterintelligence. And basically, you know, the way, the way they teach intelligence and counterintelligence now is basically based on the asset work so what happened back in the day they're studying it now so a lot of what bistralotov did is being studied in textbooks around the world when they train intelligence officers and uh, i think he's he's probably was one of the greatest if not the greatest agents of the 20th century so i absolutely hope uh, uh they or somebody maybe it will have to be me will make a film about his life uh, <laughs> That knows already have an audition tape. Yeah, you do. You're <laughs> you right. have a whole the, the whole museum, I think. <laughs> so, so I think it really is quite fascinating. And um, his life, and if any of you guys have a chance uh, to look into it and, and read about his life, uh, please do so because it's really, really, especially now when I mean, what else are we gonna do, yeah. right? You've got plenty of time to read this book and to watch the Plain Clothes Men as well. Yes. And the last the last episode of Homeland this summer. Oh, of course, of course. Yep. <laughs> so I actually am going to kind of end on that um, without giving away any spoilers. <laughs> did you like how it ended? Uh, what, our segment? Or no, uh, Homeland. <laughs> oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> um, I, you know, what's important to me uh, is not whether or not I like the ending, just like the character. What's important to me is that the ending is truthful. Uh, to the characters and the storyline and the world that has been created and we lived in for the last close to 10 years. And yes, I do believe that the uh, ending is honest and truthful. Perfect. You um, can't ask much more. With that, I just want to thank you again for joining us tonight. This was so exciting for us. I know, I think I speak for the entire museum, who's, I know some of them are watching tonight. Like this was a treat because we see you every day when we go down to the museum exhibit floor. Um, I also want to thank Stoney's and Howie again for uh, mixing up a drink to get us all in the mood. So everyone watching, if you are interested, we have a bunch of virtual programs coming up, um, including next Wednesday, we are joined by, uh, Navy SEAL Clint Emerson uh, in a segment called Break Out of Quarantine, and he's going to teach you how to survive. It, he might teach you how to break out of zip ties or duct tape. We're not quite sure yet. Um, and then uh, this time next Thursday is another Spies and Spy Master happy hour with our historian, Vince Houghton. He's going to be speaking of an a, uh, a spy who is still alive, actually, a man named Morton Storm. Um, so prepare your dark and stormies. Uh, everyone is asking if we could watch that clip one more time. So I'm going to say the bistro clip. So I'm going to pull it up, Shauna. Okay, uh, I'm going to pull it up. It is a little quiet, so you guys might want to kick up your video. But once again, thank you so much. I will end this playing the clip. Uh, cheers, guys. Till cheers. till, till you, you can so do this in person. Thank you for organizing it and for letting me be a part of this and uh, letting me be a part of this experience. Um, awesome. So thank you. Thank you. Washington. It was yeah. our pleasure. <laughs> Здрасте. Ciao. Guten Tag. <clears throat> Hello. Ah, English. Forgive me for not noticing. Welcome. Please, welcome to my home. 
You probably wondering who I am. Bastrolotov. Dmitry Alexandrovich Bastrolotov. At your service. You know, I was not always the way you see me right now. Festering in a Siberian rat hole for over 15 years. Uh, once I was charming. Debonair. Dashing. I looked like a movie star. And people said like that American actor, Clark Gable. Fashionable, too. I was a star of Stalin's socialist regime. And with that, guys, good night, stay safe. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. <laughs>